Welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter, and I'm joined as always by my cousin Shane, who goes by Big Orange Balls on Twitter. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? Oh, shit. I'm recording. <laughs> hey, buddy, what's going on? <laughs> Oh, man, if only the list are a great knew. start, ain't we, Mike? <laughs> this, this is what happens, Shay, when we try to do something new. But just for the uh, the listeners, we are literally recording live as this uh, ESPN college football playoff rankings reveal is going on. We thought it'd be kind of fun mm-hmm. to just get our live reaction to the to the top four and everything, because there's going to be a couple of SEC teams in there. But uh, how you doing, mm-hmm. buddy? Just sitting here sweating bullets, waiting to see where them balls is at. Yeah, man. No, I, I'm I, actually this this means a little bit more this year, Mike. I mean, it's been a while since we talked playoffs or BCS or anything with uh, with my balls. But no, I'm looking forward to it because there's so many things that can happen. There's so many questions that we want to answer. Just, uh, the, you know, because there's a couple of these teams, brother, that are circling around the drain, and you know who you are, Clemson, and they have these undefeated records, and at some point somebody's going to say, well, do they deserve a college football playoff spot? Or does a one-loss SEC team deserve it? I, th- I think that's that's the main thing I want to gain from from this show, especially the first one, is just how much you know how much credit is a one-loss Alabama getting? You know how much right. how much credit is a one-loss Ole-, Ole Miss getting? So uh, the power of the SEC is that going to be a problem, or or is there a chance that we could see multiple teams in the college football playoffs? And I'll make a prediction right now, Shane. LSU, I think they're. I don't know what the, you know. We don't pay a ton of attention to the polls, but the, I think they're like 16, 17, something in the poll. Yeah, I bet in this playoff poll they're a lot closer to top ten than they are fifteen. So, oh yeah, um, yeah. You know, you, you'll see SEC teams get some respect. Very interested to see if Kentucky, um, you know, Mississippi State, Arkansas, teams like that are in the the, mm-hmm. the top twenty five here. They're about to reveal it. But uh, any any additional thoughts before they actually reveal the poll here? Uh, no, no. Again, I just I'm, it's more of a, just a pressure gauge yeah. uh, with the other conferences, and and you know, there's a lot of a lot of teams that that you know maybe their schedule at the start of the season looked like it was tougher than it really was, and then there's some teams that you know we're sitting you know eight eight games in, and you're saying okay, well you know A, B, and C is now a a contender, a top 25 team. So how does that change your your perspective of the poll? So uh, just again, just more of a pressure gauge, and that's why I like the first one the best, um, you know, is just to kind of see where everybody's sitting. Right. Yeah, we usually don't even mention it till the <laughs> till the final one after, no, after the first. The first one's kind of exciting, and then the rest – Hell, they should really only do about I'm gonna two be, of these. I, I, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to be honest, Mike. There's there's part of me that's a little worried because usually I have zero distractions in the room <laughs> when we're doing a pod so I can just focus on your golden voice and, and the thoughts that are coming up. And now I'm like, look at all these pretty lights behind me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you need to wake me up, just let me know, brother. <laughs> well, let me ask you this real quick. Again, they're about to reveal the poll live and we'll react to it. But do you want Tennessee to rank higher than Georgia? going into that Athens match, yeah. or would you rather have them earn it by potentially beating Georgia in Athens this weekend? Mike, I want them to be number one, and this is why. Because if Georgia is number one and Tennessee loses to them, I, I, I think there's a real shot that they don't get into the college football playoff. I think they're mm. one of those teams that get caught out there on the bubble because yeah. they say Alabama, you know, they're going to make this – was was Bryce one hundred percent healthy? You know, the more time that you get, I, that's that's my because I like I like I'm like the devil's advocate here, man. I want to see this, Mike. I wouldn't even mind Tennessee losing to Georgia this week, knowing that they're number one going into the SEC championship. Georgia losing to Alabama. Now we've got three one loss SEC teams. 
how do you keep those juggernauts out of the college football playoffs and put in a team like TCU or Clemson or, you know, ABC that's going to get the, you know, the, the shit beat out of them week one. That's, that's, that's what I want to see. I want to, because I truly think brother, if you, if you took all of the teams in the country and you said, okay, I want the top four, I would argue that at least the top three are sitting in the SEC right now. Hmm. And as I sit here, Shane, and we got this on the background, we see these guys in their suits and their fancy studio. All I can think <laughs> is, man, this would get a hell of a lot better ratings if we had a camera live on ESPN filming Cousin Shane on his couch, beer in hand, <laughs> talking trash. They're missing out on a million-dollar idea here, aren't they? Absolutely, man. And get some real people up there. Get some real fans. Get some, you know, some players. I mean, I know they, they sneak in, you know, Pollock. And, and, and the more I see Pollock, the less I think of him as, as a Georgia player and more of just an, an analyst, you know. But mm -hmm. I just I, – I think that's what sometimes college football, you know, especially these shows and stuff, I think they're missing the boat because – you know, it's about the fans. It's about mm. that's that's who is buying the tickets. That's who's buying the merchandise. That's who's keeping this thing going. And uh, oh, we got our first reveal here. Yeah, Wake Forest twenty one, NC State twenty two, Oregon State twenty three, Texas. Oh my God, Texas twenty four, oh. and UCF twenty five. Give me a break. Oh, who did Gus? On, who Gus? did Gus what pay off for there? that? Yeah, he wears one astronaut outfit, and he's now in the top 25. <laughs> Look at that, you know? <laughs> but I will say, Texas being top 25, even though they got three losses, is a big good. That's good for Bama. You know what I'm saying? This is a team, you know, because that, that loss or that win could could get diminished if they drop any more games. So I, yeah. I think that's a good one. Here's our next roll. Yeah, 16 Illinois. Bielema is a coach up there, believe it or not. 17, North Carolina. 18, Oklahoma State. 19, Tulane. Oh, my God, get this out what? of here. 20. Put them back in the SEC, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and 20, Shane, we're, we're 16 through 25. We don't have a single SEC team in here. That that doesn't bode mm. well for Kentucky, Mississippi State, Arkansas. You know, team no. teams on the bubble here. You know what? Yeah, that's other receiving votes. But, I mean, think about what you're saying right now, Mike. Tulane, 19. <laughs> Oklahoma State just got the shit beat out of them by 40 <laughs> points. You know what I'm saying? It's like 18. They got two losses here. Now, I, I can show you a handful of two-loss SEC teams that could beat all these guys here. Oh. So, I, that's uh, – Here we got an SEC uh -oh, team, our first me. one, Shane. Number 11, Ole Miss. That's, you know, I think they deserve top 10, but 11, I'll take it. 12, yeah. UCLA. 13, Kansas State. 14, Utah. Yeah. Uh-oh. And 15, Penn State. <laughs> we got one oh, SEC God, team. It's number 11. <laughs> and and they would kick the shit out of every one of those. If you, you sent Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss on UCLA, Kansas State, Utah, Penn State, is there any question who would win out of those five teams? Seriously? Shane, we haven't even hit the top so. 10. I'm over this poll. Okay, wait. Here we go. <laughs> top 10. LSU. I told you. They beat top 10 right there. So, that that's good for Tennessee. They beat LSU. Yeah. Let's see who's number nine here. They're about to reveal it. Oh, well, they're doing the slow go here. Well, <laughs> somebody told them, hey, we got 30 minutes to burn up here. Don't do five at a time. <laughs> but also, this is going to set, this will set up a top 10 showdown, obviously, with Alabama coming to town. Add a little extra hype to that ball game this uh, Saturday night there in Baton Rouge. You know what? Brody, go, it's November and we got LSU top 10. I mean, just how happy are them Tiger fans? Not just now, but the future. I mean, I'm happy if I'm a Tiger fan just being in the top 10, but. You, you, you think about the future of this program. When Kelly starts getting some of his players in, you know, yep. where are they going to be? Oh, they put Southern Cal at number nine, Shane. Uh -huh. Give me a – get the hell out of here with uh, that. God, here we go. I watched uh, 30 for 30 uh, uh, on the uh, Trojan games or whatever. Uh -huh. Did you watch that one with, like, all of them? They're paying Bush and all that. Oh, yeah, all their cheating was, down there. Yeah, I just – I kept drifting off, you know. It's like not real football. Just kid, I just kid. I know there's some ESC fans out there. I, I oh, Oregon number eight. Oregon, that's good for Georgia. Yeah. Who Georgia just beat the hell out of yeah. them, getting a top eight win here. 
that could uh, that could lead to Georgia being number one in this poll. Absolutely, that is that's a good point, Mike. Uh, I mean, we got them here at the eight spot, seven and one Oregon, uh, playing better here of late. You know, getting some. It, finally, the Bo Show's going. So <laughs> TCU undefeated, first undefeated team. Mm, TCU, yeah. So they're giving more respect to Alabama, who has a loss. I like that because we we know Alabama will beat the hell out of TCU, right? Yeah, unless LT Suns over here or something. <laughs> <don't they? laughs> but I think that's every time I see the Horned Frogs, that's all I think about is Ladainley Thomason and and they and he ain't rostered down there. So no, I'm not worried about TCU. In fact, that whole conference, man, I I I don't think they know how that thing's going to play out. Still, you know, I mean, it's very competitive Mm -hmm. i will say that about the uh the big 12 there it's you don't know who's going to finish on top but uh i just don't think we're going to have any undefeated teams down there i think they're going to eventually pick one each other each other off yeah and i think the committee you know they probably won't admit it shane but they probably thinking that same thing that's why they put them as the uh the high the you know the lowest ranked undefeated team they just don't anticipate it's one of those where you you know TCU is going to lose, so you don't have to, uh, yeah. you know, put yourself in an awkward position where if they do go eleven and one, somehow they sneak in. You know what? Right. Do, what What about undefeated though? Do you, Do you put a team like TCU in if they, if they can just run the board? I, I mean, I don't know we're biased we're, we're that SEC podcast, but but I'm just asking real real talk here for a second. Uh huh. If they finish out the season undefeated, do you throw them in there right now over a one-loss SEC team? I mean, I'm fine with them not doing it, but you know, you, you beat everybody right. you play, you win your conference tournament, you're undefeated in the Power Five. I think you you almost have to give that that team a shot to to at least win it on the field. You know what? Mm, yeah. Ooh, here's Alabama, Shane, Ooh. number six, the Crimson Tide. Oh, there they are. That that feels, I guess, about right, even though. No, they could probably knock off anybody. Anybody in front of them, they could knock off. You know what? Yeah, and and again, when you're making a list like this, I guess you got to take account for for the record. But but like you said, it's it's hard for me not to put Bama higher up just because their only loss is against the number two team in the country by a field goal. Right, and, and it came down to the final wire. And in, again, argument I made earlier. Was Bryce a hundred percent in this thing? I don't know. I I, I don't right. think so. He wasn't as mobile as he usually is. So I I think they they Bama got robbed a little bit here. Maybe that won't affect them later. I mean, obviously they still control their destiny. But I was thinking the five spot for the Tide. Hmm. Now they're really milking this bad boy. I, number five is probably oh, yeah. Clemson. Oh Michigan, yeah. Michigan number five. Oh my God! So that means they're putting Clemson in the top four. Did, did, did we just see the bearded trader nearly knock them off at home? Seriously, I mean, the losses and, and the teams that they are barely winning are are losing. I mean, I, it's it's that's that's the thing that drives me nuts. It's not like you know Syracuse is is a two loss team. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's a, it, it, it's not a, it's not a powerhouse. They didn't. That's not the only game they've lost this year, right? Am I mistaken? No, I don't want to pull out. Syracuse, that up, but no, yeah, I think they lost. They've two. lost two, and even Clemson. This benched, Clemson thing, they, they benched their quarterback during that game too. So we're saying we who, got a playoff team who benches their quarterback to win a game. Explain to me this committee, Mike. Is this a group? Is this? I, I, they keep showing that little table there with about twelve of them sitting in there. Is these bastards the one that are picking this? Yeah. Or is it like? A, is it okay? So it's not some beat writer from Tulsa <laughs> saying, you know what? I, I, I guess was put Clemson in there because they're there every year. Yeah. And there it is, Clemson number four, matching up oh, against number one. Hmm. Well, at least oh God, number one's going to cruise to the cha- championship game in this scenario. In this scenario, could you imagine a better matchup than having Clemson week one in the college football playoffs? It's just – If Clemson th- played is, Alabama, this, Shane, what's what's the spread? I mean, I, I got to imagine it's at least 10 points, right? Oh, no. I this, this, this That would be a 16-point – I would think, honestly, Mike, and I'm not just being a homer, I think it would be a 16, 17-point game mm-hmm. if Vegas – 
you know, because it would be an absolute barn burner. They'd be pulling starters by the third quarter, <laughs> and they will be. Whoever goes against Clemson, it's just you're doing it for optics because they they did win once, uh, but Clemson's not. It's say you're you're what we got. You're a number three, Georgia. three, Georgia. Georgia Bulldog oh Shane God. disrespect card mm. is real. That that's the best news that could have happened to Kirby Smart and company. This on Tuesday evening, I think. Defending well, national champions, ammunition. number three, undefeated. Ammunition. That's terrible. Barely squeaked, barely squeaked by Clemson. <laughs> I can hear Kirby now. You know, I can hear him now. He he says, "Blow it up, put it in the lockers. I want to see it when we get to campus tomorrow. I want everybody to see the disrespect the Georgia Bulldogs because here you here you just." You kind of crowned Oregon a little bit. You put them up there, and, and then, oh God, it's, man, what you is it? you ain't gonna believe this, brother. Them Tennessee Vols, number one in the playoff poll. Ohio <laughs> State, number two, as expected. Yeah. What's this? What's this feeling like? Mm. Tennessee's never even been in the top four, Shane. They just debuted number one in the in the college football playoff rankings. What's What's your reaction to that? Let's just wrap it up, you know. COVID-2 needs to hit so we can just end this thing now. Send the trophy to Knoxville, and we'll we'll see you next year. That's all we got, folks. <laughs> just kidding. I'm not wishing a disease upon the country. I'm not saying that. That's just a homer talk there. Um, obviously, this this you're not getting an award for being there November 1st, you know, but – but this is a big step for Hopple and company, man. And, and and it's big because how it plays on the back end, brother. Because there's a real possibility. Uh, Tennessee's a two-score underdog here. And, and we got to play this game, Mike. Yeah. If Georgia beats Tennessee and Tennessee wins out, how do you keep one loss Tennessee out of the college football playoffs? I mean, this this scenario could not be better for the Volunteers. Don't get me wrong. They can't afford to get blown out. You know, this isn't a game that they can, I think, because people, you know, for the optics, if Georgia comes out and beats them by four or five touchdowns, then mm-hmm. I think there's a real shot Tennessee doesn't get back in there. But if they keep this thing close and, and even if they lose the thing, you know, there's a real shot that, that they're still getting in. So I, I think that's big for the Vols in Georgia. We 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 talked about them. You know, they've not had the 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 sexiest schedule up to this point. Right. Besides Oregon, they've not really played anybody, and and that changes here in the back half of their schedule. So th- I'm not worried about them moving up. But my my biggest concerns of this list right now, uh, for starters, is the lack of SEC teams in the top 25. But the other is is, is just how how you know Alabama sitting there at the six spot when I think they should be. Clemson should not. Clemson should be six seven. I would say Clemson should be and Alabama should be flip flopped here. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Georgia needs to be higher. But anyway, what do you think? Yeah, I just would have loved to seen a one two matchup with. Uh... <laughs> With Georgia number one, Tennessee number two, you know, have to earn it. All. I'm, yeah. Not to say they haven't earned it because, hell, I've been saying for two, three weeks now, I think Tennessee will be number one in this playoff poll. But it's just like you said, it's a statement. It's a statement for Josh Heupel and his program and what they've been able to do. And, and again, mm-hmm. I mean, they're doing it, Shane, with a roster that just – it does not match Georgia and Alabama – Right. Yet they're doing it on the field, and that's all that really matters. So, a uh, big moment for Tennessee. But we got other topics, Shane. I don't want to make this just a t- entire playoff reveal. We got some games yeah. here, and we have not even got your reaction, Shane. I've done two shows here since old Brian Harson got shown the door there at Auburn. Not that it was a surprise. I mean, this was like a a wait. Uh-huh. Brian got fired. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I was, Just kidding. I, like, I, I could have sworn we texted about this, but yeah. So no. I mean, no surprise. We've been talking for weeks, weeks on end. Is this the week? Is this the week? So no surprise. But um, you know what? Maybe what will be the, uh, the 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 legacy of Brian Harson and Cousin Shane's mind? 
what was his name again? That's that's <laughs> Brian Harson, Mike. I, I, you know what I'm saying? Let's be real. Let's just be real. This is another face, one of those guys that's passed through the SEC, and it's a fun trivia question at the bar in here in ten years. That's that's what Brian Harson is. So yeah. don't get me wrong. There are some better things ahead for the Auburn Tigers, and uh, you know, coaching search. It's sexy. It's fun. It's exciting. Uh, who they going to get? You know, I can't wait to talk more about that. I listened to you a little bit. Uh, you know, I listened to the show yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, great show, by the way. You guys made some fantastic points. And and it's an interesting list that you guys have formulated. But it's also the same list I keep popping or see popping up. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't know if you want to talk more about that or, or we just you just wanted to get my instant reaction. Well, that, well, that, and I'll give you a, mi- a minute to think of, uh, you know, a couple of, of candidates that maybe you would, if you could hire anybody right now, if Cousin Shane's making this hire, who would it be? But I, I do want to add this, Shane, because I've, you know, I've had time to think about it. I've been, um, you know, listening to to people from the inside talk about it, and man, I, you know, it's a mix of, of obviously they didn't want him in there. He was a bad fit mm-hmm. culturally. He didn't. He was not aware of what it takes to win in the SEC. And being a fit is not always important. Nick Saban was not a fit at LSU. It didn't matter because he's so good. Mm-hmm. Brian Kelly right now is is he's a horrible fit fit for LSU. He's doing a heck of a job. Fit yeah. fit does not matter if you win. Now now Harson obviously didn't win, but again he didn't know what it took. Shane, I heard stories like. You know, his son played for the local high school on Friday nights instead of going out and recruiting like every other SEC coach. He went and go saw his son. Now, it might be yeah. co- might be cold of me to, to sit here and call that out, but when you're making five, six million dollars, that's a sacrifice you have to make. Um, you know, not going mm-hmm. to events. I, I heard former offensive coordinator Mike Bobo had to drag his ass into recruiting meetings because he didn't understand how important that was. I heard... You know, uh, there was an article al.com. Derek Mason wanted to pick his defensive line coach. That's a that seems like a standard thing for a defensive coordinator. But Harson said, "No, I'm the coach. Mm-hmm. I make the decisions." And Mason apparently said, "Well, I've been a coach longer in the SEC, a head coach longer than you." And Harson said, well, "You mean at Vanderbilt?" <laughs> so I was like, oh. "I mean, he's disrespected his coaches. He's disrespecting the yeah. process." Uh, I don't know. It just it was not going to work from day one, and uh, once the loss is yeah. starting to starting to pile up, you know, I don't want to get down that scandal and allegations and all that. But um, th- he he had no chance there. You know what? No, no. But you know, I think there's there's a lot of mouths to feed down there, and, and that's the problem Auburn's been having. Uh, it's 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 eerily similar to that Tennessee search. Um, you know, when you have the Haslam's and the boosters and, you know, it, it, it just gets murky and, and, you know, you gotta, you're, you're just, like I said, you're feeding too many mouths and, and you're here. Now you're going to hear all these stories. You're going to hear a lot of this stuff coming out. A lot of it's just to justify the firing, you know, so yeah. that they can, you know, ramp up the money to, to get who they want down there. But, you know, this is 22, man. Uh, the S- Auburn, Auburn is not a, an enticing place to play right now or coach. And, I mean, you think about Malzahn, you're thinking about Brian here. There's been some some dirty dealings down there. So, it, it's, you know, you're going to end up having to pay for that, that 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 insurance that they're behind you, that this whole in- – and I think this Cohen hire, I think it was a fantastic move. Um, I'm with you. I, I, I don't think he's going to – you know, he he's not gonna. I mean, he's gonna be with the boosters, but he's not gonna he's not gonna take their advice twenty four seven like like some of these other cats have done. So mm-hmm. I think that was a good move. But you're gonna have to pony up, and whoever's coming down there, it, it's it feels like Mike that it's gonna be a name brand like uh, Lane Kiffin. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's who they're wanting to go after. Mm-hmm. But you're gonna have to pay a shit ton of money for that. It's just to convince him to come down there and face Georgia and Alabama every single year. But he likes the NIL because he's already voiced his opinion up there in Oxford. They're not. They're not. They're not ponying up. They're not letting him. That's the reason he's he's losing some of these battles. He thinks is because of that NIL, and he's probably onto something. Auburn's got that money. But if that doesn't work, then you're gonna have to get a wild card, and that's I think where Cohen comes in. You know, I think of the last hire he made up there with uh, with the Pirate. You know, the Pirate has been floating around for a long, long time. Right. And just about every SEC job that's popped open, Mike Leach's name was on, on 
that short list, <laughs> but he was the one that pulled the trigger. So then you think of somebody like a Hugh Freeze or, or uh, you know, some of these guys that's got a little bit of a baggage, a little asterisk by their name, you know what I'm saying, but mm-hmm. willing to take it for less money. So yeah, I'm very interested to see how this thing plays out down there, but the plane tracking has already started, Mike, and that's what I'm here for. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Shane, because like you said, the same name's kind of popping up everywhere, but... Um, Here's a wild card that I, for a long time, I didn't think, um, you know, this guy would leave, but circumstances change, Shane. How about, Mm -hmm. and hear me out here, Mark Stoops, Kentucky coach. And here's a couple of reasons, Shane. He's he's losing the best quarterback he's ever had. That is not going to be easy to... Mm-hmm. replace now you can do it via the portal of course that's that's probably where they'd have to look but you know their offensive coordinator does got nfl experience so that's attractive but um hell we got uh, i don't know if you if you've seen the clip shane stoops out here calling out his offensive coordinator so i'm not necessarily saying uh you know that's that's going to be the end of him but it, hell if mark stoops ain't happy i would imagine most transfer quarter uh, quarterbacks are not going to be itching to come down there and you know it, yeah I've, I've long said and this is the truth Shane Mark Stoops got the best deal in college sports he's paid like a top 15 top 20 coach he's got a deal mm-hmm. where if he wins seven games he gets an automatic extension that which where he's at now that's basically every year he wins 10 games right. he gets an automatic two-year extension so this guy's never going to be fired he never has to worry about that but you know, this was supposed to be a good Kentucky team, Shane, and they're not. I mean, let's just call it what it is. They're not a horrible right. team. I'm not sitting here saying that. They've they've lost some tough games. You know, they're they're a couple plays away from, you know, being another eight, nine win team, but that it's not gonna happen this year, Shane. And some mm-hmm. fans are, are getting a little antsy. I'm not saying they're pushing him out, I'm not putting them on the hot seat, I'm not being crazy here, but you know, there was the all the stuff with Calipari, and this is a basketball school. I mean, that's got to hurt too. And you know, I'm I'm just sitting here saying, what if what if they win seven games this year, six seven games next year? I mean, that that hot seat's gonna start heating up, and that's yeah. a lot of what these coaches' moves are, Shane. You move so that you never get to that point, and you get this big deal. And the the other thing that I've always said about Mark Stoops, I don't think he's leaving that job for just any job the only Mm -hmm. way he would leave that in my opinion is a place where you can win a national championship if he believes Kentucky cannot get there and I Auburn will be a climb no doubt but they have proven it Shane they can win the SEC they can win the national championship thoughts on Mark Stoops as a candidate for this Auburn Mm -hmm. job well, at first, you know, you're you're going to turn it off. Auburn fans are not going to be happy with the idea of Kentucky coach coming down here and, and taking that job. But again, who's taking that job? So I, I think I think you got to re- got to be real with yourself for a second. Just given the situation, if you can land Mark, and, and don't don't get me wrong, Mark's done a lot of great things in Kentucky, and I think he'd still love to stay there because he does got a sweet little setup. Uh, mm-hmm. He's he's the second longest tenured coach in the SEC right now, yep. uh, behind Saban in front of Kirby. So I I mean there's a real possibility that Mark could just never leave, and, and I think he would be good with that. But you know if you start getting some of this hot seat talk, I don't know how the season's going to play out. But you know there's there's got to be a little. Here's the thing about Stoops. Stoops is a hell of a recruiter. He's a hell of a coach. He, he develops talent, and he's able to get a lot of talent to Lexington, Kentucky, which is not an easy sell, Mike. Mm-hmm. And, and if you can switch that to the Plains with all that money, all that NIL guarantee, I, I think I think you would notice a world of difference. And, and Stoops in your living room, he could convince any of these kids to come to his school. So I think, I think if you got him down there, you'd not only be landing a hell of a recruiter, but you'd be – kind of getting back to your Auburn roots, and that's run the damn ball and play aggressive defense. And that's what won you a national championship. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a terrible high, a hire. I don't think it's a terrible look. And and the more I think about it, the more I like it. And, and Kentucky, you know, I know they're a little hurt right now with, with everything that's played out, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of asterisks. There's a lot of things that really – 
messed up this whole season. Now, Kentucky could be sitting there with one loss right now. I don't mm-hmm. think they could have gotten a, around Tennessee. I really don't. But I think they could have won every other game that was on their schedule easily. And then if you finish the season 10-2, and two, you're crowning Mark and you're giving him another damn pay raise. So uh, your quarterback's banged up. Your running back's not staying on the field. This offensive line has been banged up. It's in and out. So I, I'm not I'm – not, panicking if i'm a kentucky in fact i'm hoping that coach stoops doesn't leave but you know this is the sec and anything can happen man yeah well hey hey, brother well speaking of that we've got some huge games i wanted to get your thoughts on uh of course tennessee at georgia number one versus Number three now, according to the playoff poll here. But uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunate news, though, Shane announced here on Tuesday, Nolan Smith, defensive leader for the Georgia Bulldogs, out for the season. He leads the team in sacks. I believe he leads the team in quarterback hurries. Uh, just mm-hmm. as good of a player as he is, he's an NFL prospect. He's an even better leader for that team. So tough blow. But uh, this is the Georgia Bulldogs, Shane. You lose one guy as tough as yeah. it is, they ain't, there's not going to be a huge drop-off because they're going to replace him with another yeah. five-star that will be in the NFL in two, three years instead of one. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, it, this is not going to devastate their defense by any means, but it, but it is a blow. Um, thoughts about this going into this Tennessee at Georgia game? Well, you know, I you don't wish upon any injuries, Mike, and and, and it's the big picture. It's not you didn't just lose him for this game. Uh, he's he's done. He'll never wear a Georgia jersey again unless he's going to visit. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's the part that 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 sucks because you always think about well, what could have or you know because he is a leader of that team. So I, I hate to hear the loss. And um, but like you said. Th- that program, especially that side of the ball, you know, Georgia's absolutely loaded. So it's it's not like Nolan was out there the entire game anyway. He had he had plenty of talent behind him, giving him some breathers. So, uh, but obviously you're going to miss him. But this is this still it, it's going to come down to offense and defense in this game, Mike. We've we've that's what we've been talking about all season long. Tennessee, is there a team that can slow them down? I think. And when I was looking at the schedule, if there was any team that was going to be able to slow the Tennessee Volunteers down, it's got to be the Georgia Bulldogs, especially the way they've been playing since week one. So yeah. um, this is this is that, this is that making out a battle of titans, man, and, and they're going to pump it up all – I'm going to be – by the time this game happens, Mike, you know, I'm going to be – I probably won't be able to handle it. I'm, I'm going to have to get off the social medias. I can't watch any more. If I watch one more damn hype video, I mean, if I, I, I've been seeing them Smokies, they're playing it slow, they're playing it fast, they're doing all these different things with Rocky Top. I just, I can't, I can't handle it anymore. So uh, I'm just going to be so pumped up. It's going to be an, an epic battle. And I just hope it's a good ball game, brother. I really do. Yeah. And, and, and Tennessee, obviously, as a homer, I, I'd love to see a win. But even if we don't, I want to see it come down the fourth quarter because it's been a long time, brother, since Tennessee and Georgia have come down to a fourth quarter uh, series. So that would be nice. That would be a nice uh, uh, for the Vol fans. Yeah, and I think I heard this, Shane. This is uh, Sanford Stadium has never had a top three matchup, as incredible as that is to yeah. believe. But, of course, those are rare matchups, so uh, maybe I shouldn't be so surprised. But let me ask you this. How many points do you think it's going to take for either team to win this game? And, and do you got confidence that Stetson Bennett, if this thing does turn into a shootout, and I'm not saying it will because Georgia, maybe they, they're the first ones to, to solve this Tennessee puzzle and they shut them down. But if it is a shootout, how many points is it going to take to win this? And do you got Stetson – uh, confidence in Stetson, Stetson Bennett to go, uh, you know, score for score against Hen and Hooker and company. It's a good question, Mike. Feels like you're going to clip this and send it out there, and I'm going to get a lot of hate <laughs> mail. So I'm going to be real careful how I answer this. I think that if this became a shootout, Tennessee wins, and and nothing against Georgia and the weapons they have. I, I think. I think Brock's one of the best players to ever come through that locker room. But Stetson and Bryce aren't the same. And, you know, Bryce was barely able to go toe-to-toe offense uh, against the Tennessee Volunteers and the way they run. So I I would think that if this turned into a shootout, meaning more than 
you know, seven, I, I, I'm talking like 40 points a piece. Mm-hmm. I, I think I'm going to favor to the Tennessee Vols. But if there were any defense, like I said earlier, that can contain Tennessee, that can slow them down and not let them run their offense to their tempo and their style, it's going to be the Georgia Bulldogs because you've seen it a couple of games this year. When when Tennessee doesn't get the ball going, they 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 can find their sales down a couple of scores. Now they they got plenty of offense to get back in the games, but it, you know you do a couple three and outs with Georgia Bulldogs, buddy. I'm telling you, that's a it, it, it's tough. It's going to be a tough pill to swallow. So this could go either way. But I'm just to answer your question as I danced around it. No, I don't think Stetson can go toe to toe with the offense. But I really think that they're not going to have to because of that defense. Mm. And and here's a game to. Think back on, Shane, the last season, because Georgia, I mean, hell, they just annihilate most people, and you, you get the Florida games on a neutral field. It's rare that you get Alabama in mm-hmm. Sanford Stadium. So there's not a, there's not a lot of these matchups that, uh, you know, Georgia fans, are, I'm not trying to call them out or anything, but, you know, when these epic showdowns in Athens, I don't think you, you get them that often to where you, you get the full force of what it's like being in that stadium. But the one that comes to my mind, Shane, last season, Arkansas. Arkansas versus Georgia. It was undefeated showdown, top 10 showdown, college game day. And I think this fits a little bit because Arkansas runs – their offense is kind of comes from the same – it comes from the same tree as what Tennessee's running. And by God, mm-hmm. Shane, Arkansas was damn rattled early. And, and that crowd – you know, they didn't win them the game, but they were a huge, huge factor in that game. Sam Pittman for the next year, he, he's, you know, begging these Razorback fans, be like this Georgia crowd that, that we walked into that buzzsaw. If it's a buzzsaw, yeah. if Tennessee goes down early, I think they're in big, big trouble. Whereas what Tennessee likes to do, Shane, they jump on people and they get you down, mm-hmm. which I think could happen in this game. They're that good on offense. I got no problem thinking Georgia can come back in this game. I don't think Tennessee can come back if they get in that hole. What's your thoughts on that? Dude, now that's that's the thing. It's like Georgia really hasn't had much to play for this year. And I know it sounds stupid and crazy. And don't get me wrong, I'm not taking anything from the fans. But this game, the buzz that I'm hearing from the Georgia fans mm-hmm. is is only letting me know how amped up that that stadium's going to be when when the kickoff starts because Georgia just they they want to ruin a Cinderella season because that's what it is the Tennessee everybody's talking about look we're just number one in the college football playoffs Georgia's number three yeah they do not they do not respect the Georgia Bulldogs right now and that's exactly what these players want that's exactly what Kirby Smart wants and more importantly that's exactly what the fans want because they want. Everybody on that national stage to witness a freaking blowout. They want to beat the shit out of the Tennessee Volunteers, I guarantee it. And so this is a, you, you talk buzzsaw. If Tennessee does not score a couple of scores right out of the gate and take this crowd out of it, we're going to be fighting for our life the entire game. Mm-hmm. And what's your confidence level, Shane, that Hendon Hooker and company can – you know, do what they've been doing all season and, and be unfazed by Death Valley, even though that was a noon kickoff. Um, you know, they got down against Pitt early in that game. They they came clawing back and, and dominated the, uh, you know, the overtime. And, and, and after getting down 17-0, to it was mostly Tennessee the rest of the way. And also, I think of, uh, you know, Alabama. Alabama had an outstanding shot. Hell, we we were convinced Alabama was going to win that game after the uh, you know the fumble exchange where they score on the defensive touch. It didn't even phase them. Didn't even phase Tennessee. Yeah. Do you think Tennessee uh, you know can do what they've been doing all season and, and score 35, 40 points in this ball game? How could you not, Mike? Uh, I, I think I think a lot of that got brushed off out of everything during that Alabama game was the confidence level that Hooker and company had. 
um, like you said, the the fact that even when their backs were against the wall and it looked like it was they were out, they were still able to keep their poise. They were still able to do what Tennessee wants to do, and that is control that control the whole game. And um, say what you want, Nick Saban did not want to have to score thirty five or however many points it was. Was it forty eight? Uh, you know, he, there's no way that was part of his recipe. His, he would like to come out there and win 6-0 if he could, you know. <laughs> but, you know, Tennessee dictated that outcome. So you do that with the confidence. And I'll tell you, brother, going down to Athens, there's been a lot of times that that you, we just want to get through it, man. We want to keep it close <laughs> and get the hell out of there, you know. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm, I'm a big Gorge homer, and there's been plenty of times we go down there and, and we end the half at, with, you know, down 13 or 10. And we're like, you know, hey, this ain't bad. You know, if we do that again, we can get out of here. You know, we hung with the number one team in the country, blah, blah, blah. But this team has a different chip on their shoulder, man. They're coming in there super confident, and and it seems like they, they haven't been rattled, even though there have been some games where they've had their back against the wall. So, I don't know. This is a different Tennessee Vols, man. This is the, I'm hoping the next chapter, this is the way it's going to be moving forward. But that all starts with your leader, and Hendon Hooker is unfazed um, by, by some of these uh, opponents. Yeah, obviously you work on conditioning every week, but with the way Tennessee's tempo is, how much of an extra emphasis do you have on that this week, knowing especially with the defensive side of the ball, you've got to be able to play multiple snaps and also shuttle in and out of the field quickly? Yeah, you, you can't. I mean, you can't get your players in shape in one week. If you're not in shape, then you did something wrong long before. So we've been building uh, towards this week in terms of since week one, the conditioning level of our players has been a concern every week for me it's one of the major concerns is are you in good enough shape because if you're not it, you can't make it up in one week so it's one of those things we work really hard on uh we i don't know how much other teams condition in the country but we do a lot because i think it's really important unfortunately we haven't had a lot of games where we had to play a lot of snaps so that goes back to if you're not playing them in the game you better get it done during the week and uh you know, we've, we've worked hard at it. You will find out on Saturday if we're in shape or not. I can promise you that because they, they're, they're going to try to get a lot of snaps in. What makes Tennessee's ex four receivers so explosive? Is it the ability to create separation successfully or is it any other aspect? Uh, speed, space, uh, scheme, uh, talented arm. You know, you, you can have the best receivers in the world, and they get open all the time. If you don't have somebody that can get it to them, they got somebody that can protect them and get them to them. They do a good job of that. And again, that's the challenge for us this week. Yeah, Kirby. When just from experience, when you have your defense facing an offense like this, like 2019 LSU or last year against Alabama, how do you see a defense kind of embrace that challenge when they're facing an offense that's so highly regarded and explosive in terms of the points they put on the board? I don't know what you mean. How you see them embrace it? You see it in meetings? Yeah. Kind of embrace the challenge of facing an offense that's so explosive. Yes. I see, see them embrace the challenge every week. Gary, you mentioned Hendon Hooker. Just uh, what really stands out in preparing for him and, and maybe how far he's come even from facing him last year? I just more another year experienced in the offense. You know, he's 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 one step ahead of where he was. To think of the reps and the games he's played since the games last year. He's uh, uh, he's he's just as elusive. Um, he's got just probably the same arm talent. Those two don't improve. It's his it's his his decision making and uh, his processing and and the guys around him are playing better too. I mean, they're playing much better across the offensive line. They're they're running the ball. They're uh, they got explosive playmakers that are playing better. Um, so they're, they're, they've improved around him, and he's improved. Yeah, Josh, I know you believe in winning with execution and preparation and those sort of things. I'm, I'm curious to know where confidence fits into that. Both of these teams have pretty good reason to have a swagger going into this game. Can you win a game because you're more confident and more self-assured than your opponent? Uh, you can win a game with confidence because you've paid the price, you've worked, you've prepared uh, to go out and play the right way. So. Yeah, uh, both teams, I'm sure, are confident and should be. Um, you know, for us, this week preparation is going to be key. They're they're really good. They got you know, got to understand their schemes. You know, that's important. The personnel, the battles within the the battle, uh, are going to be really important. The line of scrimmage is going to be important. It's a physical physical game out on the perimeter too. So, on both sides of the ball, you got to match that. 
Josh, there are teams out there that have been winning year in and year out, and they know how to win games. How have you convinced these guys to have the confidence so quickly that they think they can beat anybody? Yeah, I haven't uh, convinced them. They've convinced themselves. You know, we talked about, you know, a team uh, of hope, a team of belief. You know, we were on that spectrum uh, a year ago because of our work habits, you know, not just during training camp or during the season, but, you know, the work habits since we got back last January. Uh, there's an expectation within our locker room, and uh, you pair that with good leadership inside of the locker room, you know, uh, staff and players that are connected, that compete extremely hard every single day. Uh, you put yourself in a position to, to go play good football and, you know, try to fight and find a way to be on the plus side of the scoreboard when you walk off the field. Now, how about speaking of Nick Saban, Shane, Alabama at LSU, huge game here in Baton Rouge. I mean, these LSU mm -hmm. fans are fired up, too. They hate Nick Saban for obvious reasons. This is looking like one of their best opportunities to knock him off since 2019. Um, and, and, of course, that was on the road. So uh, they have not had tasted that sweet victory over Nick Saban in Baton Rouge <laughs> for quite some time. And Alabama, of course, on the road. Yeah, they lost to Tennessee, could have lost to Texas. Uh, they yeah. man they managed it well against Arkansas, but what's your anticipation that we get a really good ball game between a red hot LSU and an Alabama team still among the elite? Hell, number six in the playoff poll, number ten. I mean, this is an epic showdown that any other Saturday, Shane, this is game of the week, not only in the SEC but in the country. But it's an afterthought mm -hmm. because of of Tennessee, Georgia. But make no mistake, this is a massive, massive showdown. Well, I think that's exactly what I was about to say. This could be the game of the week. Forget forget the the, the records right now. Obviously, on paper, everybody's talking about the Tennessee-Georgia game. Mm -hmm. But you go down there to LSU, you've got two programs. One of them will – I mean, you could end a season t on Saturday. I, if LSU wins that game, controls their destiny – I mean, nobody's talking about that. If LSU beats Alabama – they're not going to the college football playoffs. They're not going to an SEC championship. You know, we're talking about what happened to Alabama. What happened? You know, <laughs> that could happen. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I think this game is not being talked about near enough. And I think at the end of the night, Mike, we're going to be all pinned to the TV watching this damn thing come down to a wire. LSU, the way they're playing, the way Kelly's playing, the swagger that locker room finally has back, it, that's, that's dangerous. They got it at the right time. And Alabama, don't get me wrong, is a fantastic program. They, they have the real ability to, to, to win an SEC championship and go to a playoff. But, you know, they could really overlook these LSU Tigers. And then, what? I mean, outside looking in, could you imagine first of November, Saban and company getting eliminated? Whew, right. buddy. And what I'm would that you, say is... about uh, that program, Shane, losing two out of three with a big-time matchup coming at Ole Miss who's coming off a mm -hmm. bye, hell, could, I don't want to get a, put the cart in front of the horse, but <laughs> we're, we're staring down possibly three out of four losses. Um, I mean, a, a lot of pressure on Alabama, and I think no pressure on LSU. I mean, I, I realize the fans want to win this one dearly, but this is year one. This is a patchwork team. You hope for the best. If they – hell, they could lose by 50 points. I think some fans would be like mm – -hmm. Well, we, this is what we anticipated coming into the year, so it's not that big of a deal. All the pressure, in my mind, is on LSU – excuse me, Alabama. No pressure on LSU. Do you agree with that? Yes, because most people have not watched LSU lately. The first time they saw them was against Florida State. Mm -hmm. They shat on them, and then they said, you know what, they're nothing. They got a couple more years for their relevant – but they've not seen every week the development and the growth of this team. And I think that's important because I, I, I've i said it a million times, Mike, that Tennessee game could have went another way. I don't think LSU could have won that day, but maybe they win this week. That's that's just the, the how they've changed each week. It's been exponentially bigger and better. So I, I, I think this is a dangerous squad that a lot of people are sleeping on. And I don't think Nick Saban is. You know, I mean, hell, he is the greatest coach of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he just turned 95 years old. I mean, the guy's got a wealth of knowledge. He's played all these games. He knows exactly what he's walking into uh, with his uh, with his little cane there. But 
I think that this one right here, Mike, it's just there's something about it. And maybe the fact that we aren't talking about it near as enough. There's a real shot that this is the biggest upset in SEC history. And it's not – well, I don't want to say history, but it's, it's just – it's the first time that, that Nick Saban's been eliminated this early, you know. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. But I'm not, I'm just not saying that it couldn't, you know. Right. Uh, with Eli Riggs, what kind of progress did he make leading up to that Mississippi State game? And do you think he maybe gained confidence – from from what he was able to do in that game yeah i think so i think you know fundamentally we worked really hard to get eli to understand the expectation for what we want him to do to have a good understanding of the scheme of how we're playing and what we're playing and i think he's developed confidence you know throughout the season as he's learned more uh, and gotten more comfortable and i think uh, he played well in the last game so hopefully he can build on that but i think it's important that he just you know, goes into this game and bees himself and doesn't think he has to do something fantastic just because he's playing against the team he used to play for. I think that's always important psychologically to guys to be able to s- focus on what's in front of them and, you know, do their job well. How would you evaluate uh, the way your defense has defended uh, quarterbacks who can pass and run well? Um, well, you know, I, I think that um, it's very challenging to play against quarterbacks who, you know, are dual threat type of guys. Um, and this is obviously going to be a big challenge for us. And I, I think that it's something that the emphasis has to be on all 11 guys really doing what they need to do, whether it's pass rush lanes, whether it's how you cover people, uh, keeping contained in a quarterback, kind of keep it, trying to keep them in the pocket. Uh, even when he steps up, you can retrace the rush. So, you know, there's a lot of elements to doing this that you just can't rush and think you're going to go get a sack and get pushed by the quarterback, and then he's going to end up having lanes to run in. So all these things have got to be real points of emphasis for us all week long so that, you know, we have a chance to contain a guy that's a very good passer, but he's also can beat you with his feet. Just you and, and Nick, two elite coaches, right? How much do you savor the moments of going against fellow elite coaches? And you talk about the preparation. I'm curious, as a coach, do you all feel an added sense to have better preparation? Or is that counterintuitive in big games where you've talked about before, maybe doing less can be just as important? Well, I, I think it's all about what your players can execute on Saturdays, right? I mean, we can be the smartest guys in the room, but that doesn't really matter if they can't go out and execute it. So I think we're at that point both teams are as we get into, what, week nine here, um, that it's about what your players, their strengths and weaknesses are, knowing your team and knowing what your team can execute at, at a higher level. So I think the good coaches now have kind of settled into, here's what we do, um, let's go do it well, and – you got to go stop it. Um, so I think we're both at that level of, you know, we're going to do the things that we do. Um, yeah, there might be a wrinkle here or there because of self-scouting, and we might have had a tendency here or there, and they may have had a tendency, and we're going to try to break a couple of those, and they're going to try to break a couple of theirs. Um, but I think by and large, I think we know our strengths and weaknesses, and now it's about putting your kids in a good position where they can play fast and free and physical. and. And, and be the best version of themselves going into November. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I would say that, you know, when you're looking at your schedule in the SEC, uh, when you have Alabama on your schedule in November, you know, this could be one of those where you check the box if you're not playing well. Or it could have huge significance. And, and I think in this instance, um, it certainly has much more significance than, than maybe it did uh, last year, you know, where, where – they weren't in, in, in the, the race. So, um, yeah, I think you always want Alabama in November because both teams traditionally have been pretty good. Hey, Coach. Now, hey, speaking of pressure, Shane, how about this matchup? Florida at Texas A&M. Man, both these teams hurting at the moment. Whoever loses is going to be 1-5 in, in SEC play. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I asked Stephen Lassen this question. Go back and check it out. Everybody missed it. But Anthony Richardson, we've seen him start for, what, like eight, nine games. He, he had one start last year. We've seen Connor Wigman for one start. If you mm-hmm. were 
you know, let's and I, this is not reporting or anything. I'm not I'm not suggesting any of these players are even considering going into the transfer portal, Shane. But let's say they both went in tomorrow and your program needed a quarterback. Which one would you rather have Anthony Richardson to build around or Connor Wigman? Uh, I think these are could be two of the two of the stars of the future in the SEC at this position. I mean, that, that's tough, uh, you know, because you don't know. Like, I don't know, man. That's a tough question. I love the 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 tangible, the attributes that that Anthony Richards had. Like, if, if I'm building a quarterback in Madden, that's that's <laughs> yeah. the guy I want. You know, somebody that right. can scramble, somebody that can throw, somebody that can lead a team. You know, he's he's got it. He's got it. He just hasn't been able to put it all together, and that's not all on him. Because, you know, you could argue that Wigman has more pieces to work with. And, and I would argue that that if you flip-flop these these guys, there's a real shot. Texas A&M didn't lose as many games as they did. So, I don't know. I, I this, is a, this is a sneaky game, too, because there is a lot of pressure on – especially Jimbo. Yeah. I, I, and I know I've been trying to fire him forever, but <laughs> – I mean, you drop another one, another one to Florida, just when Auburn is now looking for an SEC coach. You want to talk about a perfect scenario? What if, what if Lane Kiffin went to Texas A&M? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think if those two jobs came open, there's no doubt in my mind he'd go down there to College Station. So, And, and he may take a pay cut, you know, just to go, get through these buyouts so he can be relevant again. So I, I just – not that he's not relevant. Lane Kiffin's <laughs> extremely relevant. I may edit that out. I can hear Ole Miss typing now. But uh, no, I. So there's this. There's so there's so many narratives coming into this game. Uh, you got Billy Napier and company that that really could use a a, a, a rebound. Man, mm-hmm. they they can get back on it. We got the damn media down there. You know, hell, I'll tell you one thing, Mike. I'll be on this podcast. Longer than Napier will be down there in Florida, but no, I don't know. I hope so. I don't know. Mike may fire me tomorrow, but uh, I wanted to mention that because you you brought it up, and and I wasn't saying what he said was right. Okay, and and this is I'm if you didn't listen to the pod, there was a reference. uh, uh, There's an open mic down there. I'm not going to name names. You can do your own Google in there, but one of the, the 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 writers down there apparently had a hot mic and said that he's going to be there longer than Napier is. And, and honestly, Mike, he's probably right. I mean, statistically, SEC, mm-hmm. t- you know, short of Saban and, and and maybe Kirby and and Stoops, you know, there's you don't really stay in that that position long. It's it's a short time, right? I, if, I mean, if I, things don't work. You, I get that, but the insinuation clearly is Napier sucks and he's going to be fired soon. That that's my insinuation well, the, of what that guy was saying. What I hate about Florida media, not all of them. We met my my golden hair. Uh, you know, I think he's a fantastic guy. Uh, I hope we have him on the pod more often. But but there is a handful of them down there that they're just looking for damn clicks, man. And they love a university full of turmoil because they get more reads or something. And I've never. I mean, I saw it. You saw it with McElwain with the shark incident, and, and then you know you you. It was a continuation, and and I don't know. I've never seen media attack the university and the coaching staff so hard. It's almost like they they almost enjoy it, and and, and that's not helping. That's not promoting the brand. I hate. I cannot stand that. We had an incident like that up here in Tennessee, and I'm not going to mention the the outlet, but you know they just they just they wallowed in that negativity and it, you know, that's the shit that gets going across the country and, and these recruits are looking at, well, I don't want to go down there because you know, the place is burning up. So yeah. well, I, and, I just think speaking of that, we've not- <laughs> I do want to mention this and I don't think any Florida people were upset at all, Shane, because a, a Florida media member basically got Dan Mullen fired. Uh, David Waters, Gator Dave of, of, of Gators breakdown does an outstanding job, but he was the one Shane that's that asked, Mullen, uh, he wanted to ask him like a recruiting question. I think it was after yeah. like Florida missed on like two or three big time recruits. And Mullen mm-hmm. says, "Yeah, this is football season. We'll t- we'll t- you know that's recruiting season. We'll, we'll talk yeah. we'll talk recruiting <laughs> after the season." And it, that was just like Florida people were like, "My God, the worst thing." Yeah, and then yeah. Kirby comes out here and says, "Oh, every day's recruiting season." You know, so it <laughs> it goes both ways. No, you know what I mean? 
I get it. I get it. You're going to have some of that, but it just, for me, an outside looking in, it just feels like Florida has more of that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it makes it tough because those are the clips that are going around because there's some positive things there. Like you said, you got Anthony Richardson you're building around. You got a fantastic uh, recruiting class coming in. Obviously, we lost one, but, you know, that's the shit they want to focus on is the one that got away. Right. You know, let's not talk the, about not the ones the that are coming still. The elite commits they got. Exactly. You know? <laughs> like, who cares? So he, got it, so he got a yacht down there in Miami. <laughs> You know, get rid of him. He may change his mind if that coach gets fired. You know, exactly. So I, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's, it's just, it's talking, and uh, you know, sometimes before you put shit out, I, I really think you got to think. I work here to promote this team and, and, and stop putting all that. Just, you're just trying to catch him. It's like, I got him moments, right, you know? Right. And then ironically, we got him on the hot mic. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you kind of went on a tangent. Let me just ask you real quick about Sorry. the matchup, Shane. We got Florida, their strength of their team is running the football. A&M can't stop the run. A&M's offense is coming around. Florida can't play a lick of defense. Mm -hmm. I mean, this could be a high-scoring back. This could be an entertaining game. I believe it's it's nationally televised right after college game day on ESPN. So there's going to be a lot of eyes on it. And it goes back to what I originally said, Shane. Napier, I don't want to say he's, you know, he's got a hot seat. He's year one. But Jimbo, you know, borderline hot seat. Uh, this, mm -hmm. this is going to be bad. This is going to be a bad loss for whoever loses it. And and it's it's probably going to be a high scoring fun game, but at the end of the day, it's it's one fan base is is going to be overjoyed to to snap a losing streak, and the other is just you know they they're just going to be losing support by by more fans, don't you think? Yeah, and then you you, you got the, the the Cox release, you know? <laughs> Can you say that? There's your, the, there's your the, the uh, bait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they booted no. Brenton Cox oh, off the I team just, too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got you got something like that. Here, here I am. I'm I'm trying to get a. Uh, there's your link that you can click on. So, um, no, I just think with that you lose, then then you know they're gonna spin it like the locker room's lost and or some bullshit like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you can rally and get a win, then we're talking about okay, that was the problem. We had cancer in there. He cut it out. We're moving forward. The the future is bright. So I, I think you can spin it either way, but. Texas A&M's got the pressure, man. It's not Florida Gators. Florida Gators is still year one in a rebuild program. I, I, the expectations aren't that high right now. They, we didn't expect them to win an SEC championship. There's a few games, key pivotal games, that we thought, hey, they got to win. At the start of the season, Texas A&M wasn't one of them. We knew that was going to be a loss. So there's no pressure. The, the pressure is on the Aggies and bouncing back. You've now got a quarterback. You, you're finally starting to, to get a little two-dimensional there. And, and it felt like, you know, even though you lost the game last week, there was some momentum. Them, but all that goes away if you drop a game to the Florida Gators. Now, let me ask you about this one, Shane. Kentucky, Missouri, two solid defenses, two inconsistent offenses. You know, it's probably going to be a low-scoring affair. 11 a.m. kickoff. Old Drink says, uh, uh, let's kick it over to his comment real quick, Shane, on, on drinking too early in the, in the ball game. Eli, 11 a.m. kicks. You guys care? Don't phase me, man. Yeah, I, I love it. I love 11. I love three. I love six. I've played at 8:30 at night. I, I mean, it don't. It, we love playing the game. We work our butt off. Uh, I mean, you could argue that these guys work 320, 25 days a year uh, for this opportunity, for 12 opportunities, and I don't think anybody cares about what time that opportunity is. Um, it's a challenge for our fan base, and uh, you know it's hard to get uh, loosened up that early. You know, in the morning, uh, you don't probably want to crack your first beer till after 10:30. I get that, uh, but you know, everybody's got to make sacrifices. It takes what it takes uh, to get a win, and uh, we're going to need the fans really going. Um, again, I felt like the last two games, our home crowd was the best advantage. I mean, our third downs right now. Uh, emotion on when when we get our defense on a third down is incredible and and uh, we're going to need our fan base to really come alive and be there for us and and uh, our our team will be ready to roll at 11 but I don't believe that any of us uh care what time the game is so hey drinks call drinks <laughs> calling for people to drink earlier in the day but uh, 
This is, mm-hmm. again, this is an interesting one, Shane. Missouri coming off a big win, a ranked win on the road. Now they come home. Kentucky's hurting. They got Georgia upcoming on the schedule. Uh, this this is a dangerous, dangerous spot. Perfect storm. If, if Kentucky don't show up, they're going to get beat. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen, Mike. Like I said, it's a perfect storm. You got Kentucky with their hands down, and it, it's just – you do that, you want to talk about a trap game. Mizzou coming off that that big victory with South Carolina. Momentum at their back. Defense playing out of their mind. Cook has finally, you know, decided to be a decent quarterback in the SEC. And, buddy, there's a real possibility that Kentucky loses this game by multiple scores. Uh, I, I just if, – if all goes well. I think you, you factor an early game. I mean, there's a lot of a – lot of, I don't know. I'm I'm worried about this one. I'm not setting up a Morristown Honda just yet, but <laughs> I'm telling you, I, it depends on it depends on Kentucky. It depends on that locker room. It depends mm-hmm. on Stoops. It depends on Will Levis. It depends on Rod. It just do they rally? Do the the does the seniority kick in and say, "Hey, man, we got to finish this season strong," or do they just keep looking at the rearview mirror about what happened and and I can't believe we got to this situation? They do that. They get caught looking behind them. Mizzou's going to run right through them. Any possibility you think, Shane, this uh, Liberty at Arkansas game is a trap game for the Razorbacks? Because uh, Absolutely. Yeah, because we got LSU, Ole Miss coming up at home. You know, this is a big home swing. You got that momentum. You can't look past Liberty. You should beat the hell out of them. But, you know, I think it helps that li- yeah. Liberty's ranked. So Arkansas can can focus on that and say, hey, let's go get us a ranked win. I think, I think that could be a, a blessing for Sam Pittman and company, don't you think? Well, you remember last time? Remember old Petrino came into town, what happened? <laughs> well, but so they weren't I, ranked, I, I don't though, think you, you know can... what I mean? Well, here's the deal, buddy. You got uh, you got Hugh Freeze, and he is showcasing what he can bring to the SEC. I think that's mm-hmm. the dangerous part is because yeah. he's dialed in. He's focused. This team will be ready to play. Liberty's one of those teams you can't believe are still hanging in it, you know, but right. it's well coached program. They got they got some talent down there. And if Arkansas did like they did against Auburn last week and slow sluggish start and stupid turnovers, then absolutely there's a real possibility that this is a tight ball game in the second half. So I, I am definitely worried about this one because this isn't a game you can overlook. There's a lot at stake here. Mm. And how about Auburn? At Mississippi State, this is a tough one to read, Shane, with the Harson fired. He did release a statement. I thought this was pr- kind of funny, Shane. He he basically said Auburn's got the – this is exactly what he says. They've got the potential to be a championship program. They got the fans. They got the facilities. They got the financial backing. But key mm-hmm. word here, with complete alignment, the possibilities are endless. So, you know, he's putting it out there. Hey, we weren't aligned, and, and you saw yeah. what happened. So, uh, I just wanted to make that little note. But, I mean, Mississippi State, you should smash Auburn. But, again, you just never know how a team is going to react with an interim. They love Cadillac down there. He's your interim coach. Maybe they, you know, play their hearts out for the guy. And and this is a tricky spot here for Mississippi State, a Mississippi State team that's lost two in a row that desperately needs to get on the right footing before their schedule ramps up here uh yeah absolutely but i uh, maybe mike cohen grabbed the playbook on the way out you know i mean <laughs> so there's there's maybe that that would be an added advantage taking a couple of pictures before he left you know but I, I just thought this was awesome i wanted to read this tweet from justin ferguson it says career rushing touchdowns for auburn's last nine head coaches and it's all the way back to pat dive all the way to Brian Harson's all zero. Then you got Cadillac Williams, 45. <laughs> <laughs> so 45 career rushing touchdowns. So he leads that category. I, I, I don't know. It's just, this is interesting. I thought, you know, one of the comments you made uh, yesterday's show was you, you always worry about these interns. Like they get an opportunity. If they catch fire toward the end of the season, they got an opportunity to win this job. So, I think this is a big rally, a big wake-up call for that locker room. I'm not counting Auburn out, but but you know, there's there's this is a sneaky game and and, and a dangerous game because they're going to get back to that running and and that's what they got is two fantastic running backs down there. So I, I'm kind of eager in this one. Now, final one here, Shane, South Carolina at Vanderbilt. Man, Shane Beamer. 
coach of the year. We, you know, let's give him an extension, all this. We're ranked in the polls. You lose one game. All of a sudden, you're only a touchdown favorite on the road to Vanderbilt, which hasn't won an SEC game in like 30 consecutive conference games here. <laughs> this is a, another tricky spot. How will South Carolina respond? Players calling the coaching out. Uh, you know, Jaheim Bell, although he's back on board, he's, he's all happy. But, man, this is a tricky, tricky spot too. South Carolina should win this game, but got to like the spot for Vanderbilt with two weeks to prepare for this. And I threw this out, Shane, just for fun, because I was just – I didn't realize this at the time, but Spencer Rattler, 1,600 passing yards, five touchdowns, nine interceptions. A.J. Swan, the true freshman who's only played like half the season, 1,000 passing yards, eight touchdowns, one interception. It's just – it's shocking how Vanderbilt's getting more out of their talent than South Carolina. You know what? This one's an interesting game, too, just because – this is an offense, man. Vandy can run. Vandy can throw. And, and if, as soon as you count them out, the, you know, they put up two or three scores. And what worries me is South Carolina has a tough time getting two or three scores against everybody, not just right. not just one or two teams. It's like, you know, you I, this this Clark Lee is going to do everything he can to get an SEC victory, brother. He came so damn close against Mizzou. Uh, I, I guarantee this is one. This is one of those that he has a little star by saying, this is my opportunity to get that first SEC win. So this is this is going to mean a lot more to Vanderbilt than it will South Carolina. And don't forget, Shane, I mean, I, I don't know how much this really factors into it, but last season Vanderbilt, this was the game they nearly won. South Carolina needed yeah. a, a last two-minute drive, scored a touchdown to win by one point at home. Mm -hmm. So, again, that doesn't, doesn't exactly translate rosters, different different coaches and everything, but hmm, I, I don't know. This I is remember them announcing that. We were at the Ole Miss, <laughs> yeah. we old Miss game, and they announced it, and I was like, wait, what did they say? <laughs> don't, don't be that, South Carolina. Don't, don't be that. What? Did they say Vanderbilt? So <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So a lot on the line for Shane Bieber and Spencer Rattler and company. Got to get this win. You're going to be a laughing stock of the SEC if you can't get it done. But, hey, brother, we went long on this episode, so let's cut it here. You got anything else before we hop off the line? Mm, I just keep thinking about that comment. Like, we, we, didn't, we weren't prepared, you know? It was like, <laughs> what? You know, did you watch any film? Was there no game plan? <laughs> uh, no, I, yeah, that's that's an interesting one because obviously we everybody wants Satterfield fired. But uh, but no, man. Other than that, just breaking these games down, man. We could have started this list in reverse, and and by the time we got to the end, it was just it's it's making for a great slate of games. You know, it's November. We got Thanksgiving right around the corner. Tis the season. We got the college football playoffs out. This is when shit gets real. Uh, it's like uh, I saw uh, uh, shit. What's his name say down there at uh, LSU? Um, man, I'm terrible at names today. I don't know. Brian take, Kelly. What is it called? Yeah, let me do that again. It's like Brian Kelly says, you know. Um, pretenders are in October's contenders are in November or something like that. And, and that's the truth, man. We we've all pretend for so long and, and we've, we've got to where we're at, but this is when it gets real in November. This is what makes or breaks the, the tail end of this season. It picks who goes to the college football. I mean, there's so many just options and opportunities out there and, and, and teams can squander it or teams can run with it. So uh, it's going to, it's shaping up to be a hell of a weekend and i'm excited for it yeah no doubt brother well i appreciate you as always i appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out with us we'll catch you on the next one all right see you guys go vols oh man dog went off right yeah, over <laughs> yeah he said he's had enough man come on i'm hungry <laughs> <laughs>